If you've ever been fortunate enough to play Sonic the Hedgehog on a real life Mega Drive, if you haven't then get one off eBay for about 15 quid, there's really no excuse. Then this will be familiar to you. This is how Sonic runs on 50Hz European equipment. It's slow, it doesn't feel quite right, but to a UK bound kid back in the 90s this is all we knew, this is how we thought Sonic was meant to be. It's somewhat ironic that this little blue character, who was supposed to be the personification of speed, just wasn't over here. But fast forward a few years to emulation and things seemed a little different. Sonic was less patience testing, the music was less frustrating, the game felt fast like a Super Sonic Hedgehog should feel. But why was this? Did Sonic just speed up as he aged? Well, no. The difference is most emulators will run as standard at 60Hz. This is what the Sega Genesis ran on and the Japanese Mega Drive. And it's this frequency change which makes Sonic move quicker than we're used to over in Europe. So what is this frequency? How does it weave into and affect our electronic lives? It all goes back to the power supply. We discussed in my clock speed video how Hertz is a measurement of frequency. How many cycles or pulses in a given second. 100 Hertz equates to 100 pulses per second whilst 1 MHz equates to 1 million pulses per second. But rather than being driven by an oscillating crystal as is common for computer clock speed, the original driver for electrical current was the generator or turbine speed used to push the electricity out to the grid. Because we use alternating current, the polarity of electricity is switched many times a second. This has a nice side effect of allowing transmission over long distances and then if required it can be converted back to DC in the home. Back in 1891, Westinghouse Electric Company had decided that because 60Hz produced less flicker with the arc light carbons in use at the time, it was the best choice. And so that's what spread throughout North America. Over in Germany, AEG Company had started using 40Hz, but noticed it created flicker on their lighting also. Upping to 50Hz seemed to eliminate this, and so that was their chosen standard. This standard then spread throughout Europe. There are positives and negatives to each choice, but we're here to discuss Sonic rather than the details of mains frequency. Now you may be thinking, yeah but the Mega Drive had a DC transformer so current shouldn't really matter. Which is true, but we're talking televisions here, and European TVs were originally designed to accept signal input at 50Hz compared to 60Hz in the States. Televisions were designed so their vertical synchronisation rate equated to the main supply frequency. This helped prevent power line hum and magnetic interference. So the difference meant screens over here were refreshed at 50 frames per second, or 25 frames in reality due to the bandwidth limitations of the analogue power transmission. Whilst over in NTSC land, signals refreshed at 60 times per second, equating to 30 frames per second given the same bandwidth limitations. These bandwidth limitations effectively meant that only half the picture could be transmitted each second. But I'm not talking about the top half was displayed in second 1, followed by the bottom in second 2, that would create a somewhat disruptive viewing experience. Instead the signal was interlaced, meaning on the first scan all the even lines were refreshed, followed by all the odd lines on the second. On PAL this happens 25 times for each set, resulting in a display of 50 interlaced lines per second. Whilst for NTSC, this equated to 30 frames per second, or a refresh rate of 60 interlaced lines per second. So, derived from these early power supply frequencies, this 60Hz display standardisation spread throughout the Americas, whilst 50Hz spread through most of the remaining world. One interesting fact is that only half of Japan uses a 60Hz main supply. The reason for that is because AEG first supplied 50Hz generators for Tokyo and the eastern regions in 1895, whilst America's General Electric supplied 60Hz generators for Osaka and the west. Through the use of transformers and frequency converters, Japan has seemingly never felt the need to standardise this any further. But. Given Japan's adoption of the NTSC format, all Japanese Mega Drives are designed to run in 60Hz, with Japanese televisions adapted to compensate in 50Hz regions. So let's get to the point, how does this affect Sonic? Well Sonic was created in Japan, and as consoles at the time were designed to plug into the same inputs you'd receive TV signals through, they had to be converted to the appropriate format, and therefore were originally designed to run at Japan's 60Hz NTSC rate. 
when Sonic was released over in Europe, the game's coding was left unchanged from the code in the NTSC version. So, if you play Sonic over here in a European Mega Drive, 50 frames of action will be displayed to us for a given second of game code execution, as opposed to 60 in other regions. Effectively, this stretches out the gameplay and leads to a 17% slowdown of the game. Music, motion, responsiveness, the lot. This of course gives you more reaction time and makes the game somewhat easier, but the pace and action also feel a little more sedate. Almost as if they've been drugged. Sugar. You may also notice that a larger border appears around the game. Again, this is an issue of standards. PAL has a higher vertical resolution, consisting of 625 vertical lines, opposed to 525 for NTSC, leading to a European Mega Drive outputting a resolution of 320 by 240 compared to the Genesis's, is that the plural? 320 by 224. To compensate for this extra unused space, the Mega Drive dishes up a larger border feeling more akin to the large overscan borders present on the Commodore 64 or Sinclair Spectrum. To get a real feeling for this, here's a real-time comparison between the intro sequences of Sonic on both standards. You can really feel that 17% drop when you compare them. Going back to PAL can initially feel like a painful process. Acceleration feels upsettingly slow, jumping feels like pushing through golden syrup, waiting for a platform is like waiting for a village bus, not to mention the end of level score tallying. And it's not that the PAL Mega Drive couldn't handle putting out the increased number of frames, it's just that the PAL standard couldn't accept it, and therefore a standard European Mega Drive wouldn't allow it. It's a bit like taking a standard game and squeezing it through a bottleneck. You get all the gameplay, it'll just take longer to get it. If we simply slow down the Genesis Sonic footage by 17%, we get exactly the same outcome. So the problem then could actually be rectified in the game's coding. The standard Sonic engine is designed to output its music and video at 60 frames per second. The power bottleneck built into the Mega Drive's VDU chip just forces it to slow down. If the Sonic engine had been written to recognise a power region, then the code timing could have been altered to push the same gameplay out in 50 frames as opposed to 60, in effect actually making it lighter work for the Mega Drive hardware. A visual interpretation of this could be likened to grabbing the power sneakers, which throws the PAL version into double speed, equating to 166% of the standard Genesis gameplay speed. But it's not all bad news for PAL. We've already discussed that PAL has a higher resolution, but it can also yield a higher fidelity image as every second line inverses the phase of the colour signal. Any damage to the signal therefore comes out as a saturation discrepancy as opposed to hue issues on NTSC. PAL is also more effective at transmission through bad weather, but unless you're trying to transmit your Mega Drive's RF output through the airwaves, that's really quite irrelevant today. These differences often led engineers to pun NTSC as never the same colour, and PAL as perfection at last. In the UK, we also had SCART plugs allowing a much higher RGB picture quality and could be provided by the coaxial cable, something North America lacked. NTSC, of course, yields slightly more frames per second, but the interlaced difference is barely perceivable to the human eye. 
Of course, it's not just the Mega Drive this affects, whether it's a NES, SNES, Master System or any other international console, if the games weren't coded and optimised to also run in 50Hz, through coding and manipulation of gameplay timing variables or frame skips for example, then there would be differences. If you take a look at Sonic 2, the European release had manipulated coding to bring the music up to NTSC speed. The gameplay is also slightly sped up, although not quite to NTSC levels, presumably accommodating for European players being used to the slower Sonic 1 gameplay. Other games, especially European developed ones, compensated for the Switch completely. Whilst conversely, a lot of Master System games were designed to run from the go at 50Hz due to the machine's popularity in Europe. In some of these cases, if you try and run the game on a US system, you'll potentially get a game which is too fast to be playable, such as Bubble Bubble or the New Zealand Story. Now, one thing to note is that sometimes there are separate releases optimised for PAL or NTSC, so slotting an NTSC optimised cart into your 50Hz master system will still make the game run slow and vice versa. With the arrival of digital TV, and the ability of modern LCDs to run both NTSC and PAL, you might think that you could just hook up your UK Mega Drive to an LCD and play at NTSC speed nowadays. However, this isn't quite the case. Although the TV standard is the underlying cause, the hardware built into the region-dependent consoles still has to be told to output to those standards. That's why you have to modify a UK console to run at 60Hz and vice versa. So with that in mind, it feels appropriate to quickly revisit clock speeds. A PAL Mega Drive console actually runs at a slightly slower CPU clock speed compared to NTSC, 7.61 MHz versus 7.67 MHz, as to other machines ported across to PAL. But why is that? Well, remember that oscillator crystal, that's the master clock, the thing which regulates all the components, and this crystal needs to cycle at different speeds to accommodate for the differing colour encoding frequency on each television standard. NTSC requires a sub-carrier frequency of roughly 3.579 MHz. PAL is 4.433 MHz. The master clock in each machine is then a multiplication factor of these frequencies. This frequency is multiplied by 15 to get a clock speed of 53.69 MHz for NTSC models, and by 12 to get a clock speed of 53.203 MHz for PAL models. This master frequency can then be divided to run all the components, including the video display unit responsible for the video signal out. In the case of the Motorola 68000 CPU, the divider is 7, equating to a CPU speed of 7.61 MHz on PAL and 7.67 MHz for NTSC. It's effectively as close a match the engineers could get whilst retaining the colour encoding frequency. Now, because of its quirk, you can usually run NTSC on accommodating PAL screens without modifying the clock, but the image will be black and white, and this was the same as what they used in the Acorn Atom back in the 1980s. There are crystal modifications to get around this, which raises the clock speed and allows output on NTSC. There's also the option of using the RGB out on region switchable consoles to display a PAL 60Hz mode. The only problem is you're still riddled with a slightly slower PAL clock speed, but as it's less than 1% difference, it doesn't really have an effect. The larger effect is the 17% difference between the 50Hz and 60Hz modes. It's these little details which have always plagued my mind in the 60Hz versus 50Hz debate, and I for one feel refreshed to have brushed up my knowledge on this. So, if you felt like I did, hopefully this video has cleared up the same questions for you. Now, all that's left to do is to fire up the Fusion emulator, flick the power switch, and remember how Sonic used to be, before we knew all about this technical malarkey. Back in Christmas, 1992. Thank you for watching this comparative video of the 60Hz vs 50Hz debacle. I do hope you enjoyed it, subscribe for more, share it, give it a thumbs up, and then perhaps click on one of these videos if you fancy some more nostalgic action. In any case, thank you incredibly for watching, and as always, have a good night.